Hey everyone, good evening. My name is Deandra Ryan Moss and I am your instructor for Lambda School's mini boot camp, which is starting today, right now, right here on YouTube. So let me go ahead and introduce myself just a little more. I said hi to everyone on Slack and then we can jump in. So as mentioned, my name is Deandra. Uh, my background initially is in math. I have a mathematics degree. And within my degree, I was first introduced to programming. Actually, technically, I was first introduced to programming when I was 14 and taught myself how to use HTML and CSS to create a way cooler MySpace profile than everyone else, but we don't talk about that. So I was formally introduced to programming in college. Um, I worked, a, I had a research grant where I did some extremely nerdy things like creating scripts that analyzed undifferentiable integrals and fun things like that. And then after college, I actually attended a boot camp myself where I got a little more ramped up on some less extremely specific skills. And then I worked, uh, I worked in the industry for about two years as a developer, mostly I was hired on for web development, but mostly did data aggregation stuff. So I'm a big fan of databases and processing data, which is not what we'll do at all in this boot camp. Uh, and throughout that, I've always kind of had a foot in the teaching world. I love to teach. I used to work in Austin, Texas, where I was. I used to work with an after school program teaching high school students web development. And then now I've transitioned over to being um, primarily a teacher. So I work with Lambda School and I teach this awesome class. And it's really fun for me to get to see a new generation of programmers and pass on the torch. So that is a little bit about me. Um, I am based out of Bisbee, Arizona, if anyone is curious. And yeah, that is who I am. So let's go ahead and jump into a little bit more about Lambda School and about this curriculum, and then we can get into the curriculum itself. So just a, two housekeeping matters before we go any further. Uh, the attendance form has been floating around Slack a bunch, so we definitely want that. Um, so yeah, for sure, if you haven't already, go ahead and click that link. I'll even post it again if you guys want, because I know I'm really excited about how active everyone is on the chat channel, but it keeps getting buried. So definitely fill out the attendance form. It's part of how we'll be able to uh, assign you guys your group so that you can actually have homework and discussion and be assigned a project manager who can work with you. So I'm gonna go ahead and post that attendance link in one more time for you guys, one second. Right, there it is. So definitely fill that out. And then I also want to send out the syllabus. And I'll cover that a little more later, but I'll just send that out for you guys right now so you have access to that from the get-go. I suspect I might have to send this one out a couple times as well. So there you guys go, two basic things. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit first about what Lambda School is, and then we'll talk about what this mini boot camp is specifically. So Lambda School, uh, Lambda School is a computer science immersive. So what that means is we take someone who is a beginner at programming and we get them to the point where they are ready to be hired on the job. So it is really a start to finish process. Uh, there is of course a lot of work that you guys have to do along the way. It's, we do focus a lot on being self-directed because that's a huge part of the job, which I will get into more later. Um, so if you're wondering who Lambda School is for, is this right for me? Uh, I wouldn't rule yourself out based on current knowledge. For example, this boot camp, we're assuming nothing. We are starting at zero. If you have a little bit of skill, um, if you're not at zero, but you're not quite at the point where you could be hireable, it's still for you too. That was kind of the case for me when I went through my immersive. I had a little more background than a lot of the other students going in because I had exposure to it through my degree. And I be hired. It's good because I couldn't. So it, it is really for a range of people um, anyone from a total beginner to someone who has their feet wet a little bit but isn't quite where they want to be. Uh, it's also for people who are really serious about becoming a programmer, it, it is a big commitment mostly in terms of time and energy. So primarily it's a full-time course. That means Monday through Friday, regular work hours. 
So that is six months of your life where that is your primary focus. We do offer a part-time course because we know it's not possible for everyone to quit their job in advance. So that part-time course runs in the evening. And I believe that only starts twice a year. Um, and so I, I believe we do have one starting soon this summer. You would have to reach out to Karen Zachary to get the exact dates on that if you're interested in that. But the full-time one starts every single month. So it is, it is definitely not for the faint of heart. It is for someone who is extremely dedicated in spending their time and energy to get where they need to go. Uh, another question a lot of people have is, what kind of financial position do I have to be in to attend Lambda School? And we really, one of the core missions of Lambda School was to open this up to anyone who is dedicated and ready to learn to not only have this be available to people who could fork out a bunch of cash in advance. So something that's really cool about Lambda School is our tuition model is extremely flexible. We call it a de-risked education model. And that's what, and what we mean by that is that if you do not want to or cannot pay anything up front, that is okay. We will allow you to pay your tuition over the first year or the first two years that you have a job. So to state that extremely explicitly, if you do not get that job that you come into our school to get, if you do not get a full-time computer science job making 50K or over, we don't get paid. So the burden is super on us to give you what you need to get you to that point where you're able to be hired. And like, yes, there is some risk. You know, you have to dedicate a lot of time and energy to it, but you don't have to put any money up front on it because we are confident that we're going to get you where you need to go to get that job. So a little more about what the actual school looks like once you're in. Um, as mentioned, it is a full day, but homework time is included in that. So you won't be having to work on Lambda School stuff outside of those hours. So it really is a blend of activities during the day. And we try to model that in this mini boot camp. So yes, there's going to be live instruction time. There's going to be group work time. There's going to be so working on your own time. So it is really a mix of things in, you know, and trying to give you some of that autonomy that you're going to experience a lot of in the workplace, but also, of course, giving you direction and giving you instruction and having TAs available even when you're working solo so that if you get stuck, you don't stay stuck. And then the last thing I want to talk to you about with Lambda School is a little bit of our some of our job resources. So as mentioned, we are very motivated to get you a job when you're finished with Lambda School so that we can get paid and because we think you're great and we want you to go out there and show your skills to the world. So a couple things we provide, we do, we have hiring resources. So we'll help you create your resume. We'll help you figure out some steps. If you're not super confident with the job interview process, we'll help you with that. And then finally, we actually have some partner companies. So we are able in some cases to hook you up directly with a company that you might end up being able to work for. So we do have a full hiring process in place. So it's not like we teach you the info and then just shove you out into the world. We're there with you from the beginning to the end. So if you are interested in Lambda School and you wanna learn a little bit more about the hiring process, as I mentioned, Karen Zachary is the person you wanna to talk to. She's a much better resource than I am in Slack. So if you have more questions about that, reach out to her directly. Also feel free to post things in the channel so that if you know other people have the same questions as you, it becomes part of the public conversation. And then the last little thing I wanted to mention is, as I said, there are lots of people coming into Lambda School at slightly different levels. This boot camp is definitely for people who are right at the beginning of their programming journey. If you're someone who's a little further on and wants to just get straight to it, you're welcome to take the hiring challenge right now if you're interested. So I'll actually go ahead and post that in Slack right now. So if anyone is like, I'm just ready to get to it, that's available for you. But if you want, if you think that this boot camp is going to be useful and will teach you things that you don't know yet, I'd probably stick around and go through the two weeks of this mini boot camp first. So let me go ahead and post that for you in Slack. Okay, so that is a link to the hiring challenge. Once again, that is for people who want to get right to it and feel like they might be further along in the learning process and ready to 
cut ahead a little bit. And if at any point during this boot camp you feel like I already understand this, this isn't helping me, go ahead and jump in. You know, where we want you to apply and join up as soon as you're ready for it. So yeah. Okay, so that is Lambda School at large. Let's talk in a little more detail about this mini boot camp. So we want to the the first and foremost, there are really two goals of the mini boot camp. The first one is to give you a better idea of what Lambda School looks like, to give you a little free sample of it so that you really are sure that it's something you want to commit to. Uh, the second piece is we want to actually teach you some basics. So it's kind of twofold in that we're trying to mirror Lambda School so that you know what you're, what you're uh, getting into. And also we just want to get you some of that basic knowledge so that when you start Lambda School, you're in a really good place to learn the main curriculum. So let me talk a little bit more about the topics that we'll cover in these two weeks. As I mentioned, they're all in the syllabus. So if you wanna follow along in the syllabus, go ahead. So we are going to teach front-end web development. So as I'll get into a little later today, um, there are kind of two sides of web development, front-end, back-end. Both are covered in Lambda School but we're only focusing on front end in this web in this mini boot camp just to keep things simple and fundamental. So, we'll go over today a little bit today and all of tomorrow we're going to cover CSS and HTML. So, those are the two languages that stylize our web that what we see on screen is HTML and CSS. So, that's what we'll cover today and tomorrow and by the end of tomorrow you'll be able to build a basic web page. And then we'll spend the rest of this week and all of next week talking about JavaScript. So JavaScript is what a little bit more of what happens behind the scenes in web development. So it's um, I'll cover this a little more later, but it's it's a little more computer sciency. It's a little more let's create var variables or manipulate text or numbers. Um, and so a lot of what we'll be learning in this mini boot camp won't at first sight seem to be web development specific, but we're building those basic skills that you'll need to do all of the web development stuff. So it's true that yes, by the end of this mini boot camp, you're not gonna be able to design a web app that's all shiny and fully functional, but you will be well on your way to that. And those are all the skills that are gonna be covered in the main curriculum. So just a little taste of what's to come. Uh, definitely really important basic stuff that every programmer needs to know. That being said, if you're coming from another language, a lot of things will look familiar to you as we dive into JavaScript, though you might learn some things that are JavaScript specific. So that is the mini bootcamp. As far as other resources available, Slack is huge. That's, um, and just so you know, there is, I know there's a chat thing on YouTube, but I am sadly not capable of keeping track of two chats at once. So if you wanna communicate with me live during the lesson, do it through Slack, that's the one I pay attention to, that's where I will take questions at the end. And as we go on, um, as we go on through the class, I might not be able to respond to every single thing that's coming up live, but there will be time for questions at the end. So yeah, please utilize Slack during the lessons, please utilize Slack beyond the lessons. There are TAs available for questions. I'm always happy to receive a, question, a personal message from you guys. In Slack, it's fun for me, but I will say that I'm not always online. So if you have a question that you need answered right now, I am probably not the person to go to. But if you wanna just say hi or have a question or give me feedback on the lesson, I'm always happy to receive that feedback on Slack. So Slack is really big. Um, you, you guys already have the syllabus and then you guys, if you filled out the attendance form, which hopefully you did, you guys will be assigned a project manager, which is someone on our Lambda team who will kind of be responsible for you and several other students and will be the main point of contact for the homework. So how each night works is we will have a lesson that's about an hour, maybe up to an hour and a half. And then you, from your project manager, you will receive the homework and work on that independently. And then you'll come together as a group at the end and you can do questions, discussion, and all that. So I'll walk you through that a little more since it's the first lesson at the end of my lecture today to make sure that everyone's on the same page for how the homework will work. All right, so that I think is all of the housekeeping stuff that we need to take care of. So I hope that you guys 
know who I am, you know what Lambda School is, and you know everything you need to know about this mini boot camp. And if there are points of ambiguity, reach out in Slack, definitely talk to Karen about admissions questions. And if you're, if you're still wondering something about this by the end of the lecture, I'm happy to answer any questions at that point. So now let's move on from the less fun stuff and uh, we can start to talk a little bit more about what computer programming is and what development, what web development is. And then at the very end of the lecture, we will dive into just a little bit of HTML. So mostly this tonight is going to be a more high level lecture, more like let's talk about what it is type content, but we will start to do a little bit of coding at the very end. So if you're really excited to get in and code, don't worry, the rest of the lectures are really coding oriented. It's just the first night one is a little different. So yeah, let's talk about, let's start with the topic of what is computer programming. So that's one of those really broad terms that we all have a general idea of what it means, but maybe aren't sure exactly what fits into that computer programming umbrella and what doesn't. So to start, I will say computer programming is a very broad term. And it really just means any sort of task in which we are communicating with a computer via code, uh, basically in an attempt to get it to execute a series of tasks or complete something for us. So what, that, what our end goal in writing code is could be vastly different. Uh, one example, of course, is building a website. That's, that's what we're oriented towards at Lambda School is building a website, building a web app. That's something that we can use computer programming to accomplish. If we wanted to do something completely different, like build an AI chess player, that's also something that we could do using computer code. Um, if we also, if we were interested in data and wanted to enter data in a database, retrieve data from a database, manipulate it, create analytics of some sort, that's another task that computer programming could be used for. There's, it really goes on and on. And so, when we're trying to solve a particular task using code, one of the first questions might be, what language do we use? And there are tons of computer languages. Um, everything from these low-level languages in which, which talk to the computer at a basic level. So at the very bottom level, a computer is just circuits. It's just little electrical impulses that are either on or off. And there's some very nerdy stuff where you actually write code that talks to the computer at that most basic electrical level. I, I wish I were nerdy enough to know how to do that. I unfortunately am not. And that is definitely outside of the scope of Lambda School. But that's something that's out there. And it's something that's good to be aware of when we're thinking about what all is under this umbrella. So that is going to be a totally different type of language. Uh, the types of language we're using are tend to be a little more user friendly. And so there are really broad languages. JavaScript is a quite a versatile language, though it is generally used for web development specifically. Some other really common languages are things like Java or C, C++, C Sharp that are kind of broad stroke languages that can do a lot of different tasks. There are also extremely specific languages. So you'll be introduced tonight to HTML. HTML is used to put content on a page. So for example, HTML, you can only use it to create web content. There's nothing else. It's, it has such a narrow, restricted mode of use that there's really no other task you could possibly use HTML for. Whereas JavaScript is a more broad language. So even though it's designed for web development, you could use it for something else if you wanted to. So you'll see that there's quite a variety in what languages look like, the, um, how versatile they are, the different tasks you can use. You know, there are languages that are specific to databases. SQL is a really, is like the staple of database languages. And once again, it's a language that's designed for a specific task. So you couldn't use SQL to, you know, write a, script that kept track of your grocery list that, you know, that wouldn't be a good use of SQL, but you know, you could do that in JavaScript. And if you wanted to build a web app, you could do that with HTML and CSS as well. So, so yeah, there's this computer programming topic is really broad, but there are some threads that tie it all together. And I think that syntax is 
one of the one of the key concepts and maybe one of the hardest things to get a handle on when you're brand new to programming. So syntax is it's an English term, you know, you might have heard it in an English class, but it really just refers to in the context of computer programming, it refers to what does the code look like? Um, what keywords can we use? What where do brackets and parentheses and white space go? So when we're talking to a computer, there's no there's no room for wishy-washiness. You know, we have to precisely write code in exactly the way that the computer will understand. So if you're texting your mom, you know, you can leave off punctuation or misspell something and she'll be able to know what you're saying. But when you're talking to a computer, things have to be exact. The the brackets and colons and semicolons need to be exactly where the computer expects them. The keywords need to be exactly what are expected. So there's this necessity to be extremely precise and exact. And we'll see as we dive into HTML tonight and different languages and different tasks throughout the rest of this course, we'll really pay close attention to exactly what the right syntax is because that's this habit that we're not in of needing to be precise and that's something we need to change when we become programmers is thinking about exactly what am I putting on the page. So the last thing that I want to talk about is um, a couple terms that you might hear thrown around, such as framework, library. So I wanted to just clarify what is the difference between a language, a framework, and a library. And this is those are some terms that really, as you just go on and hear them, you'll start to get a better sense of what they are. But just to introduce you guys to that, so a language is a totally, each language is a totally new set of keywords and syntax, and you'll see commonalities. You know, there are a loop in Python versus a loop in JavaScript are still gonna be kind of similar, but the syntax is totally separate. Whereas a framework is a little more specific. So for example, JavaScript is used for web development, but a framework in JavaScript like React even narrows the way that you can use JavaScript to do web development. So a, so a framework will, will narrow the way a language is used. It's kind of like a layer that's put on top of a language um, so that you can use it more effectively. It basically makes it so you can use something more efficiently, but it takes away some of the versatility. So we really love frameworks. They're an extremely big part of web development. They're a really big part of what you'll learn in the main Lambda School curriculum. We don't look at any web de development frameworks in this course, but I wanted to introduce you to the term. So if you're telling your friends, hey, I'm learning how to do web development in JavaScript, and they're like, oh, what frameworks are you using? You could be like, oh, we're just using vanilla JavaScript right now, but I'm going to learn how to use React in the main curriculum, so that'll be exciting. So yeah, that is a little bit about programming. So let me talk a little more about web development specifically because I've mentioned a lot of topics in this that really are outside of the scope of you know, what I know or and what you'll learn in Lambda School. And I wanted to do that to give you an idea that this is just the tip of the iceberg and that one thing that's extremely exciting about learning to program is this whole world opens up to you. And every, it's every language you learn it becomes a little easier to learn new language. So if if you know web development seems cool, but what you're really interested in is machine learning, yeah, you're not going to learn um, machine learning specifically here, but you're going to start to learn the skills to get into all sorts of other fields, whether it's something you want professionally or if you want to just kind of mess around with that on the side. So, but let's narrow the focus down to web development because that really is what we're here to do. So web development is exactly what it sounds like. It's all about creating content on the web. So every website was built by a web developer, every web app. Um, mobile apps are very related, but a little different. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll definitely talk about, especially in the main curriculum, how to be mobile friendly, but it is a slightly different set of skills, but a lot of overlap. I know a lot of people who do both. I know some people who just specialize in one or the other. So what goes into building a website? Um, it turns out it's a lot more than what you as a web user see on the surface. So a lot of what you see on the surface is just HTML and CSS. So as I mentioned earlier, HTML is all about the content on the page. What 
text is on the page? What images are on the page? Is there a button? Is there a form? Uh, is there a link? That's all HTML. CSS, which goes hand in hand with HTML, is style. So CSS is all about what does it look like? What's the color scheme? How big is the font? Where is the, you know, where is the text or the button or image positioned? Um, how much space is there between when the, where the site starts and the top of the page? That's all CSS. So when you go to a page, most of what you're seeing is HTML and CSS. There is a little bit of front-end JavaScript thrown in there as well. And front-end JavaScript is all about kind of functionality. So if you click a button and, you know, if you click to submit a post to Facebook, that's all JavaScript. Um, anything that's kind of interactive on the page is going to be JavaScript. But JavaScript goes far beyond the front end. And so there's this whole other world of web development. It's the back end. And as mentioned, that's not something we'll cover in the mini boot camp, but it's absolutely something that you will learn in the main curriculum. So the back end is extremely critical. Um, and it, yeah, the back end is extremely critical. And it's all about data, really. So uh, when you go to your Facebook page or your Twitter feed or you know even YouTube, all this content appears on the page, and that lives in some database somewhere else. Um, you know, all that data is being stored in some database elsewhere. But when you go to that page, that data needs to not only be retrieved, but there also needs to be some sophisticated logic to figure out what videos pop up on your feed, what Twitter posts should you have access to? What should you see on the page? What shouldn't you? When you log in or create an account, how does it verify that you are who you say you are? Where is the password store? How is the password stored in a way that makes sure that hackers can't get to your password? All of that, all of that is backend JavaScript. So there are tons of things going on behind the scenes that as just a regular web user, you might not think about. And one of our goals here is to get you to not only start to think in that way, but then to start to be able to build that. So yeah, that is really the gist of what happens in web development. There's that, you know, pretty, hopefully pretty looking page on the screen that you see with all the useful content. That's HTML and CSS. It's in this modern day and age, most likely going to be interactive to a degree. That's front end JavaScript. And there's also probably going to be data involved. There's going to be an ability to for you to submit data, whether it's creating an account or logging into an account, submitting a post, sending a message, and an ability to retrieve data. And that is all back end JavaScript. So as mentioned, we will learn the front end side of it in this boot camp and really only scratch the surface of the front end because that is a big topic in and of itself. And then the back end will have to be left in suspense. So you guys will learn all about that in the main curriculum of Lambda School. And you'll also learn about some other unique challenges that web developers face. Of course, aesthetics, just the how the page looks is extremely important to web developers. User experience is extremely important. Thinking about things like efficiency becomes really important because load time is critical. You know, if you go to a page and it doesn't load, you're going to move on. So these are all kind of these unique challenges that you have to think about as a web developer. And once again, we won't be able to get into too many of those in this mini boot camp, but these are all topics that we're really going to dive into in the main curriculum at Lambda School. So that is web development. The next topic I want to cover is the idea of a code base. So we've talked a lot about what you can accomplish with code, but we haven't talked much yet about how to write code. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys quickly so that we can talk about what a code base is, and I can show you a very simple example of a code base. So first, I think I'm going to just define the term, and then I will pop up that example on page for you. So a code base, in the most general sense, is just a collection of files that all work together to accomplish some sort of goal. So within web development, all of that logic that I just described, the, from, from the front end, what does it look like, the front end functionality, all that back end database stuff, all of those are probably going to exist in different files because there's tons of logic going on to just build even a fairly simple web app. But, but you'll have all these files together in one folder 
and they all communicate and they all work together to accomplish one goal. And that is a code base. That's a web development code base. A code base could also work together to accomplish some other task. You know, if, as I mentioned, this example of creating an AI chess player, you still probably would have a lot of different files together in one folder working to create this end goal of this chess player. So let me go ahead and share my screen and I'll show you an extremely simple example of a web development code base. So one second. Okay, so here is a tiny little code base. So right now I have an HTML file on page. Don't worry if you guys don't quite understand what's going on here. We will talk more about the details later. And then notice in this directory that there's another file. This is CSS. So the files in a code base aren't necessarily the same language. And in fact, you almost always have multiple languages within one code base. But these files work together to create a website. So this is just a little example of a code base. And so as a web developer, most of your day is spent on the job working on something like this. Of course, as mentioned, this is an extremely simple example. And I will say that most of the code bases I've worked on have had hundreds of files in them. So these things can get pretty complex. But it's nice to be able to work on some of these really simple toy code bases from the get-go. So I just wanted to show you this to give you an idea of what a code base looks like so that you guys can start using and understanding that term. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about in this, uh, in this similar topic is a text editor. So you will not actually need a text editor for this class. Everything will be happening in sandbox environments, and I will explain what those mean next. But, um, but if you want to start doing a little more on your own, or if you're curious about experimenting with um, some more formal type code, I use Sublime Text. It's a free text editor. It's free online. There are a couple others, Atom and VS Code, which is which are quite popular. So if you want to download a text editor and start playing with it, I'd recommend Sublime. I'd recommend VS Code. I'd recommend Atom. All good text editors. And if there's something else you find that you like, feel free to go with it. So yeah, that's uh, text editors and code bases. And yes, I will get to what a sandbox environment is next. So sandbox environment is um, kind of a simpler way to create code. So what the sandbox environment that we'll use is called CodePen. And so I'll go over this in a little more detail later, but essentially I can just start writing HTML directly in the screen and it will pop up immediately. So this is ex an extremely useful learning tool, um, and it's what we're going to be using throughout this course. But it's not actually what a developer would use if they were working on a code base in the real world. So I wanted to show you what an actual code base looked like so that you know you're kind of aware of the shortcuts that we're taking. That being said, I'm a huge fan of these sandbox environments. They're extremely useful, especially at the beginning stage. So we will come back to CodePen in just a moment. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to talk to you about. So let me actually stop screen sharing for a second here. All right, so the very last thing I wanted to talk about before we get to the actual coding is a little bit more about the kind of job you might expect to get. So hopefully I've gotten you guys excited about what computer programming is, what's possible with computer programming. And now that we have some of these basic terms in place, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what the job looks like, because presumably you guys are here because you're interested in getting a computer science or web development job. So, and I happen to have firsthand experience with working one of those jobs. So I wanted to share a little bit about my experience and some you know, secondhand experiences from friends I have in the field so that you guys have a sense for what might be at the end of this rainbow, so to speak. So I will start by saying, you know, every job looks really different. So in that interview process, definitely be asking a lot of questions and communicating about what you want. But um, 
but really most of the day is spent programming. So the vast majority of my time as a programmer was spent writing code, which is really great. You know, yes, you definitely get pulled into meetings. Um, there's some amount of just planning that's necessary. You know, usually I worked on different teams that had different workflows, but sometimes we would have one planning day and then spend the rest of the four days in the week coding. Uh, I did work on a team where we had an entire planning week. So we'd have one week of planning and then two weeks of coding following that. That was a little bit excessive. I kind of would like secretly code during the planning week. Um, it's, re it's a really cool job to work because I think that the kind of people who are drawn to this are people who are very like no nonsense, like direct communicators, like let's not waste time, let's get down to it. So it's cool to be on a team where a lot of people are like that. There's a lot of similar mentalities and just this excitement about building things and putting something together. Every team's gonna be a little different, but I've found that a lot of computer programmers share those kind of similar attributes of being excited about building, excited about getting their hands in things and not the kind of people who wanna waste time just like get to it direct communicators like so that's really cool um and that's something that i personally really enjoyed about being a programmer another thing that's really neat about being a programmer and once again this is job specific but there tends to be a little bit of like cool or lenient culture around it um there's a lot of you won't find especially in this day and age you won't find a lot of suit and tie type programmer jobs uh, you'll find a lot of like, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of this like weird shifting emphasis towards like, let's have a ping pong table that, which is not to say that that's the most important part of the job, but it is cool that there's this big shift away from like that stuffy office mentality. And that's, I think, especially happening in the programming world. So, and there's often, once again, job specific, but I found definitely with myself and with a lot of my friends and associates in the field that there is a lot of flexibility, the ability to work from home sometimes, the ability to come in late, shift around your schedule. Because you're not working with customers generally, you can oftentimes tweak things so they happen on your own time. So that was a huge benefit for me. But I think the main thing that I want to say about being a computer programmer is that it's a place where you always keep learning. And that was just the number one thing for me. So these skills that we're teaching you in Lambda score are relevant right now, but things are constantly evolving in the computer programming world. So oftentimes I was told like, hey, you're gonna build something in this language that you don't know, or we want you to use this framework that you've never worked with before. And of course there's gonna be ramp up time where I have to play around and learn it, and a good boss will be understanding of that. But that's really exciting that for me, or for some anyone who loves to learn, that you keep learning on the job. And so really in Lambda School, yes, we wanna teach you the languages, we wanna teach you the skills, but above all else, we wanna teach you how to learn. And that's not us being trite, that's literally the most important skill because whatever is relevant right now will not be relevant in five years, maybe not even in one or two years. So it's a fast evolving field and it's definitely for people who want who don't want to do the same thing every day, who want to be dynamic, who want to challenge themselves and new, learn new skills on the job. So yeah, that is what computer programming is and being a computer programmer is all about in a nutshell, as best as I can explain at least. Of course, these things will start to make a ton more sense as you dive into this world, learn more skills, learn more languages, learn frameworks and all of that. So, okay, enough of me talking at you about this. Let's start to actually write some code because I know that is what you're here for. So yeah, um, we're gonna learn a little bit about HTML tonight. So I've already talked to you about what HTML is. I'm gonna show you some examples and then we're gonna start to actually uh, learn a little bit of how to write it. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again and then we can talk a little bit more about how HTML fits into web development. Okay, so up here I have the Lambda School website and I'm going to use this as an example of what HTML is. So on this page, we have a few things going on. You know, there's this picture, which is also a link, this like logo, there's this picture down here. We have some, 
you know, some text up here with some drop down menus attached, a button, some text, and then just like a bunch of other stuff as we keep scrolling down. So uh, uh, there's a lot of HTML going on. So um, all these things are HTML. This header right here, that's HTML. Somewhere behind the scenes, there's an instruction to the computer to put a header that, um, to put a header that says a revolutionary new school that invests in you. There's also somewhere behind the scenes, a bit of text that says, let's have a paragraph that contains this text. Behind the scenes, we can see that there's a button that says, see how it works. So remember that HTML is not style. So nowhere in the HTML code does it say the button should be red or the text should be white. It, the HTML does not say, okay, there should be a gap between this logo and this text. Um, and, uh, or, you know, that this, uh, this menu should be oriented over towards the right. So that is not HTML. HTML says what is on the screen, but not what color or where or what size. So to kind of drive that point home, I wanted to show you an example of some code that does not have any CSS on it. Or, so this is just HTML. And we can see that it looks a little bit like something from like the late 90s, early 2000s, back when the internet was super ugly. So um, yeah, there's still a header, there's a subheader, there's this paragraph and a button, but there's no color, there's no style, there's no positioning. So this is just raw HTML. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what HTML is versus CSS. All right, so let's go back to this and I wanna show you a couple other things. Okay. So if we wanna know what is going on behind the scenes with this, so I've, we can kinda, if we know a little bit about HTML, we can guess, but we can actually see the HTML on every page. So here's a little cool tool that might help you start to get to know this. So if we go ahead and right click the page, there's a little thing on every page that says view page source. So if I pull this up, all of a sudden the HTML code is accessible to me. Unfortunately, it's really hard to see what's going on here because it's this is something that's called uh, minified, which makes it extremely difficult to see. But it is kind of cool to know that behind the scenes, we can see some code going on here. So don't worry about this. Don't get freaked out by this because this is like almost impossible to read. But that's something that exists. Uh, another thing I want to show you, which is more important and will be part of the homework tonight is that if we once again, and I am in Chrome right now, so this might be slightly different in other browsers, but if I right click and do inspect, this whole little hidden world pops up. So over here, we can look through all of the HTML on, pa on the page. And once again, this is going to seem really overwhelming right now because you're just learning this stuff, but, and you'll have a chance to explore this type of thing more in the homework. But over here, hidden out of sight is every single thing on this page. So we can kind of click around and see what's going on here in a little more detail. And we can, I even actually, by digging around, found the element back here. So this is the piece of code that says, hey, put a header on the page that says Revol a revolutionary new school and then another header that says that invests in you. So we can see behind the scenes that there is code referring to these things. So that is a little bit of what HTML is. Um, of course, this is far more complicated than anything you guys will be working with or writing from the get-go. So let's pull that sandbox environment so we can get to HTML in a little bit more manageable of a way. So, as I mentioned before, we're going to be using sandbox environments. Uh, one of them is CodePen. At this point, hopefully all of you guys have visited CodePen and created an account. If you have not done that yet, you will need to do that before the homework starts. So, you know, do that right now or do that when the lecture is over if you want to be able to keep paying attention. But you will need CodePen. And I always encourage you to code along with me. Uh, if you want to pull up CodePen on your own computer because it will help you understand what's going on more. 
So I have just the most basic bit of HTML on page here. So I've created an element called a div. So when we're thinking about HTML, we're thinking about, we need to think about elements. And elements are different. They're, they can be things that contain text like this. They can be buttons. They can be containers for other elements. But they are the building blocks of, they're the building blocks of HTML. So I'm going to introduce a few elements to you guys today. The first one is the div. So the div is the very most basic element. It's often used as a container that we put other elements in. So right now I've put some text inside of it and we can see that text appear on screen, but oftentimes we use them as containers for other things. So I wanna next introduce you to a paragraph. So paragraphs are definitely for text. So if I wanted a longer bit of text like, So if I had a little bit of text here, a great place to put it would be inside of a paragraph. So, um, so yes, divs often contain other smaller elements, but paragraphs tend to be good for text. Another element I wanna show you is called a span. So a span is a little bit, is similar, but a little different in that spans also often contain text. Oops, here we go. Um, but the big difference between a span and a paragraph is that you can put multiple spans on one line. So, so now I have two spans on page. And notice that my two spans appear right next to each other on the screen. If these were paragraphs instead, they would appear on separate lines. So that, so spans and paragraphs are both for text. The biggest difference, not necessarily text, but for now we'll say text. Um, the biggest difference is that whereas spans all fit on one line on the page, paragraphs appear on two different lines. So another element I wanted to introduce you to is called the header. So there are multiple headers h1 through 5. So h1 is good for header text. h2 appears a little smaller. And I bet you can guess that h3 will appear even smaller. And I'm not going to bother with 4 or 5. I think you get the gist. A word of warning with headers is that by default, they do appear Lar the H1 appears the largest, H2 appears the next largest, et cetera. Um, but you don't want to think about these as being size oriented because really CSS is where the size should come from. And in, in the real world of programming, these sizes will always be overridden. But you really want to think about these as being oriented towards importance. So if you have an extremely important main header, it should go in an H1. If you have something that's pretty important, but maybe a subheader, it should go in H2, et cetera. And that is relevant because that's part of how search engines um, sort pages. So if you type something into a search engine that perfectly matches the content in an H1, chances are that page is going to pop up first. If you type something into a search engine that matches something in an H3, your website might not pop up quite as quickly. So that is one of the reasons it's important to differentiate between these different headers. All right, so um, those were the three, those were actually the only three elements I wanted to show you. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about syntax. So, I've kind of just dived into this without explaining what I'm doing. So let me start again with this div. So when we're creating an HTML element, we need to know the name of the element. So div is short for divider, but you always have to type it as div. If you did divider, or dividers, or divider, or anything like that, the computer is going to have no idea what you're talking about. It's looking for specifically div, D-I-V and it won't recognize any other spelling or variation of this. Similarly, if I did 
header one, it wouldn't know what I was talking about. So you have to be really precise in these element names. You, can, you can't really create new ones. Uh, you can only use the ones that exist already in HTML, and you have to spell them exactly the way that the computer expects them. Luckily, if you've forgotten, oh crap, is it div or is it divider? Is it h1 or is it header1? Then you can always search. There's tons of documentation online. So I will go ahead and search HTML elements. And notice that these things start to pop up. There's W3 schools or developer.mozilla are all really good references. And if we click really either of these, we can find a comprehensive list of all these elements. So it's pretty easy to find these things online. You will memorize them as you go along, but precision is important. And if you have any doubt, then you can um, then you can always Google. And I see some people on Slack are bringing up H6. My apologies, I forgot. I misspoke and said there were five. There is actually six. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Six header elements. I usually don't use H6 because I'm lazy, probably. So my apologies for that. Um, but yes, if there is any doubt about anything, including how many header elements there are, that is what Google is for. And I am a big believer of don't store useless knowledge in your head if you don't need it, and always outsource to the internet, which might be me enabling my laziness. But it's a common mentality amongst programmers. So use those online resources. They are there, they are your friends, and they are definitely a big part of how real programmers on the job function. So as you guys move through your homework and forget little syntax things or keywords, just Google them. That is the first place to start. So yeah, so with the element name, it has to be precise. Um, we can't just come up and be like, oh, I wish that there were a potato element. Doesn't work, doesn't exist in HTML. The next thing I wanna talk about is the brackets. So as you guys might have noticed, there is kind of a pattern to what I've been doing. Um, use these little pointy brackets in HTML. So once again, if I tried to use different brackets, now the computer is super confused and it thinks that this is text I want on the page. That's because these are the only type of brackets that are recognized as being HTML. So no flexibility there. It has to be the pointy brackets. And then finally, I want to talk about the opening and the closing tag. So when we want to start an element, we do the two brackets with the element name in the middle. When we want to close that element, we do the same thing, but with this slash right before it. And so you'll notice that that pattern holds with all these different elements. So same thing if I have an H1, same thing if I have a paragraph, et cetera. There are some self-closing elements that have a slightly different syntax. I will cover those tomorrow. But for now, we can just assume that whatever elements you're using, you use this, this pattern, this syntax of, Open the tag, close the tag. So let's talk about what goes in the middle. So as we saw already, text can go in the middle. So I could type in, I am a div. It appears on page. That text is considered inside of our div element. If we type text afterwards, Now, this is one of those examples where being inside of a sandbox environment slightly obscures what's really going on because there are actually other elements that are kind of out of sight, out of mind. But the takeaway here is that this bit of text is not within this div. It is kind of floating on its own right now because it's after the closing tag. So this thing would not be considered inside of the div, whereas that would be. So we can definitely put text inside of elements, we can also put other elements in elements. So as I mentioned, divs are often used as containers. So we can put, if we want, let's say a header. And then a paragraph.
And then let's throw in a span as well. I'll put two spans just to remind you guys that spans have this kind of automatic property where they appear on the same line as each other. So all four of these elements are inside of the div. And in fact, if we wanted to take it even further, we could put another div inside of here and put the spans inside of that. So this is starting to get a little more complex. Let me. So now we have a div that contains a header, a paragraph, another div, and then inside of that second div, we have two spans. So everything is nested in HTML. Um, elements contain elements, which sometimes contain more elements. Um, you'll find that certain elements are used for nesting, like divs, as I mentioned, are often containers for other things, whereas you wouldn't really see anything but text inside of a header, generally. Um, so that is a really important way to think about HTML, because even though on screen it kind of just looks like everything's stacked up, there's actually this big div going around everything, and then within it a heading, within it some text, and then another invisible box. And in fact, I'm going to just really quickly add some CSS. If you're not familiar with CSS, don't worry too much about what I'm doing over here. We will learn it tomorrow. So I've just told the code to put a black box around all of my divs. And let me do one more thing, actually. So now let's put that away. Now it's all of a sudden a lot more clear where these kind of invisible divs are. So we can see that there's this outer div where, that holds everything. And then we can see that there's this inner div that holds our two spans. So that is really how we think about HTML is these elements oftentimes nested within each other. So the last thing I want to talk about with HTML is white space. And so by white space, um, I really just mean the new lines and the tabs that I'm doing over here. So that is for, that is for the programmer, not for the computer. So whereas these brackets and these keywords are completely 100% necessary for the computer to interpret your code correctly, the new lines are not. So I could toss everything on one line, or I could do something even more erratic. I can't do that. But um, I can do all this erratic stuff and notice that the code is not affected. Uh, but all of a sudden, this just became really difficult to read. So in not just HTML, but in all languages, there tend to be white space, new line, and tabbing conventions. And for every team and every project, they might be slightly different. But these exist so that you can read your own code and so that your fellow programmers can read your code. So pretty standard is that when you have, is that whenever you start a new line with a new nested element, you tab in. So in this way, it's really visually easy to see the layers, right? We can see that there's this one div that exists on the top. Um, we can see that there are these three elements on the next layer, and then within this div, there are two more nested. So the tabbing is reflecting what's actually going on on the screen. And what's really nice, too, is that uh, text editors and CodePen has little arrows so that you can you know, tuck things away and keep things out of sight. And that's another really useful tool for keeping track of what's nested and what. So white space is, you know, tabbing in white space are really easy to neglect at the beginning. It's really, it's, it can be frustrating. Um, it can be really frustrating at the beginning when you're just trying to get it to work, to feel like, oh, I have to worry about tabbing or, you know, this is a waste of time, but it's critical. It is, it is critical. So you really need to practice this from the beginning and make sure that you're using good code form and that your code is pretty and readable. Like I promise you that you will create so many problems for yourself if you don't start with these good habits. So even though the computer might not care about white space, do not think about it as optional because it is definitely not optional. I mean, it is something that you could get 
fired from a job for not adhering to their code style standards uh, because it's it's just cons you know if you were working with a team and you had to edit something someone else wrote and it looked like this with all this crazy tabbing that could make your job twice as difficult or you know it could take what would be a quick fix and turn it into something that takes an hour so not optional white space very important so that is just a very basic intro to html um, Hopefully you guys learned a little bit and you're starting to get excited. As mentioned, tomorrow we are going to really dive into this. We're going to learn some more intricate stuff we can do with HTML and we're gonna to start to look at that CSS. So you guys will know what in the world is going on over here. So yes, tomorrow will be much more coding oriented. And, um, and yeah, that's pretty much all I have for you tonight. I do wanna go over the homework and then I will open up the floor to questions. So let me go over the homework really quickly first. So uh, as mentioned, you guys are going to be assigned a PM, a project manager, and put into groups that if, if you have not filled out the attendance form, please do that or else there will be issues with the homework. So um, what will happen is every night your PM will provide you with a link to the homework and the homework will happen directly within these sandbox environments. So here is our homework for tonight. And since we didn't do a ton of coding tonight, the assignment will be a little different. So we have two exercises for you that are a little more um, high level. So we have some questions for you to get you to think about, first of all, why you're here and what you wanna get out of this experience, some of your thoughts about programming. And then our second assignment is going to be all about inspecting a website. So as a reminder, I did that over here with Lambda School. So I went ahead and I right clicked and I hit inspect and this little sidebar popped up and you wanna be on the elements tab. And in that way, and hopefully this makes slightly more sense now, you can see some divs on the page. Um, you can maybe see, let's try and find some headers. Uh, notice that header, that's different than H1. Let's see. having trouble finding things. Uh, another thing you can use, you can do is if you click specifically on an element, it'll, and so if you right click specifically on this header and click inspect, it'll take you over here in the code to exactly where that H1 is. So we can see that these are actually H1s and that this down here is actually an H3. So you're gonna be playing around a bit with this. So I wanted to do a little reminder of how to go in and actually get to this elements tab and inspect specific elements. So I know this thing is overwhelming. It's always overwhelming even when you've been programming for years, but we definitely want you to explore and start to poke around. So back to the homework, that's gonna be assignment two is inspecting a website. And then when, and so these two assignments will be, you'll actually be writing out your answers on here. Um, and definitely take some time to actually answer and think about these questions. Uh, I recommend three minutes on each. I know that actually is a long time, but I want you guys to really think about these and really write about them. One, because you won't have anything to discuss in the groups. And two, because I you know, think it's good for you to think about if this is something you're really serious about before you commit to it. So hopefully this will be a good way to dive into that. And then finally, when you're finished with those two, you'll pull over the HTML tab and you'll actually write some HTML code over here. So, yep, and um, so all your code will go within the body over here. And there's some other stuff on here that you don't, actually we don't really need, but that's all right. So within the body tabs over here, you'll be writing some HTML. So um, yeah, that is the homework for tonight. I wanted to go over it a little bit. Uh, there is some CSS on here, do not edit that. Uh, maybe if you finish everything in your board, you can play around with it, but do not edit it before you're finished or it might make life more difficult for you. As mentioned, tonight is a little bit of a weird lesson just because we're only getting started and there was a lot more talking and there's a lot more writing in the homework. I want to assure you that from here on out, most of our lesson will be spent actually coding and the homework assignments will be a lot more programming oriented. So. 
If you're worried about that, don't worry. It's going to change what it looks like a lot starting tomorrow night. So that is a little bit about the homework. Uh, now I'm going to open up the floor for questions. So I, I see one already, which is a question, do we do the homework on our own? So yes, the homework will be done individually, but then you'll get together in groups at the end and everyone will discuss things, talk about things they were stuck on, kind of go over the homework. So you will come together as a group at the end and your project manager will lead that. Um, let's see. So yes, do individually and then regroup. Um, someone was requesting the link for the homework, your project manager will provide that for you shortly. So um, another question is, is it required that we use CodePen for the homework? So yes, we do ask you to use CodePen. It's it's all set up in code, and for at least these assignments, some later assignments will be in Repolit, which is um, a different environment. So all these things will be done directly in the sandbox. That will allow, we've set it up so that'll be the easiest place for you to do it, and that also in future assignments will allow you guys to turn it into us directly. So if you want to play around on text editors, Outside of this, if you want to experiment more with something on the homework, on the side, feel free to do that in whatever environment you want. But for the homework, stick with CodePen and Repolit. Let's see. OK, we've got a lot of questions. A lot of people are asking where to get the homework. Um, that will be, sit tight with me, that will be sent to you. Let's see. Chris wants to know if there's a way to have your work checked in CodePen. Uh, there are no tests you can run, but what's nice about CodePen is that everything will appear on screen. So you should be able to have a very clean visual, um, visual representation of what you're working on. And then if there's any confusion about if it's done right, you can talk to your group about that afterwards. Let's see, other questions? Um, someone asked about CodePen Pro. You will not need CodePen Pro, and I believe you do have to pay to get it. Let's see. Um, someone asked about where the groups meet. It looks like, yes, so the groups, everything from here on out will happen on Slack, not on YouTube. Let's see. Um, I see a lot of different questions. Someone asked about GitHub. So if anyone has explored some of the previous lessons at all from uh, previous sections of this, we used to use Git and GitHub. Um, that has been completely eliminated from the curriculum. So Git and GitHub are tools that are used for code collaboration. So in the professional world, if you have multiple programmers working on the same code base or project, Git is a tool that allows you to do that but it's something that we decided not to use in this course. So there, there will be no need to use Git or GitHub. If you're curious about it, you're welcome to look into it on your own or look at some of the old videos of this bootcamp online. Uh, GitHub is definitely still used in the main curriculum of Lambda School. So you will learn and use GitHub when you get into Lambda School proper. It's just not being used in the mini bootcamp. Um, someone was asking about a span feeling. So um, Jo McCatherine said that she understands what it does, but is not quite sure why. So for me, the answer to that is, is it's kind of hard to explain. Um, it's, I would say it's one of those things that as you use it more and more, you, and as you see more and more code written by other people, you start to internalize the sense of when would I use a span? When would I use a paragraph? For now, I would just make sure you understand how to write one, how to use one, what visually the difference is between the two. So we're very much just in a beginning experimental phase. And one thing that I will say again and again throughout this curriculum is that you won't have a deep and comprehensive understanding of this. That's just, this is way too big of a topic. Um, so a lot of the topics we'll introduce here, you just kind of have to practice using them and the full comprehension of what is the correct you know, when would I use this? When would I do one thing? When would, I, when would I do another? That just will have to be developed over time as you work with more, write more code and work with other people's code. Um, we have a, 
we have a question about um, admissions. So if, if you're interested in applying right now and setting up an interview, the first step is that coding challenge. But yes, if you're ready to set up an interview, Karen Zachary would be the person to talk to. So really any admissions questions, go to Karen Zachary. Um, Sebastian asked about a deadline for the homework. So everything is happening live. So the, the homework time that's gonna be set aside right now will be um, all the time you have to work on the homework. So if you don't fully 100% finish it, that's totally fine. Just work on as much as you can during this time. If you want to spend more time outside of class working on things or exploring things, you're welcome to, but it's not required. Okay, we have a question about college experience. So we do not care about college experience. We, the whole point of this is that we kind of think that CS degrees don't do a very good job of getting you ready for the real world. So um, yeah, so we only care about what you're capable of knowing, not what you already know. So if you have zero college experience, you are welcome. If you have a degree, you are welcome. If you have a degree in anthropology, you're welcome. If you have a degree in something more technical, you're welcome. So that's not something we prioritize at all. Admittedly, um, when it comes to hiring, that can have an, like getting a job that can impact you. I know plenty of computer programmers who don't have college degrees, and they're awesome. You know, some of the most talented computer programmers I know don't actually have college degrees, but the reality of it is that some jobs will care about that. So it's maybe something to keep in mind, but I wouldn't at all feel like if you don't have a degree or don't have a degree in a STEM field, like you can't do this because that's completely not true. Um, let's see. We have, I'm still getting a lot of questions about a link to the homework assignment. So you guys should all be receiving your groups and PMs and that will all be taken care of. So that will come to you. If, you know, if we get off the screen and, you know, in five minutes you still don't have the homework link, maybe make a fuss, but I promise it's coming. Patience. Okay, um, I see more people are typing, so I will sit around and answer more questions. Uh, we have a follow-up question about um, degrees and job stability. Um, in my experience, so one thing, I will give you a direct example from my company. So the company I worked for did not, we didn't really look at degrees when we were hiring programmers. We didn't really care. And in fact, we had so many bad experiences with people with CS degrees that we kind of like started looking at them as being a detractor almost. Um, but one thing that was a challenge is that in order to be promoted past a certain point in our company, you had to have a degree. So there was some limitation on upward mobility in our company but that was partially because I worked for like a large corporation where there was a lot of bureaucracy involved. I also knew a lot of people who worked for smaller companies and especially for startups where degree was not important at all. Um, I will admit that having, I know from my own experience, having a mathematics degree has helped, but I also know a lot of people who don't have degrees or who have degrees in art or literature or philosophy or just about anything you could think of who have really great stable careers. So it is, you know, I don't wanna say that it's nothing to not have a degree, but it's definitely not a deal breaker. So um, we have a question that's, will our performance during the homework problems be reviewed during admissions to Lambda School? So no, we will not be, there's no formal grading here. You know, it's, if you don't, don't feel like, oh, if I don't get all this right, or if I don't finish it, I won't get into Lambda school. We do want to, in the coding challenge, you need to have the baseline of knowledge to pass the coding challenge. And in the Lambda school interview, we'll definitely talk about your experience in the boot camp. Um, and it's true that if, you know, if you had a really miserable time in this boot camp and nothing made sense, um, then that might be that might be an indication that Lambda School isn't right for you. But we don't we want to challenge you. So keep that in mind as we go along is that we've put this in place to challenge you and we don't expect you to understand everything fully. 
And so if you're not finishing the homework every time, or if there are certain things that don't fully make sense, don't feel like that means you won't get into Lambda School because we're setting that up to push your boundaries. Um, the point of this boot camp is not 100% full comprehension. All right. I think that the, it looks like the questions are kind of winding down. I'm gonna give you guys one more minute to continue to ask things. All right, I'm seeing a bit of silence on the, um, on the Slack channel. So I will go ahead, I think, and wrap up. Oh wait, one more question, or a couple more questions. Um, someone asked, how long is the part-time course? The part-time course is a year long. So the full-time course is six months. Part-time course is a year long and in the evenings. Um, and someone asked if this can be applied to mechanical engineering. No, not directly. I mean, certainly there's going to be some overlaps and there are things that involve code that relate to mechanical engineering, but web development itself and mechanical engineering don't have much overlap. Um, so, okay. I think I'm going to call the quits on questions because otherwise we might be here all night and I want to make sure that you guys get a chance to get to your homework and get in your groups. All right, well, that was lesson one of Lambda School's mini boot camp. Uh, we still have a lot of activity going on in Slack. I can stick around for a minute and try and answer some questions. And as well, the uh, TAs will be available online to help you guys out. So if you have more questions or if you think of a question later, feel free to post in Slack. And there are people monitoring that. So we'll try and get you to answer that. So beyond that, I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me tonight. I know there was a lot of chat and not a ton of coding tonight, but I promise you that is changing. And starting tomorrow, we're going to almost exclusively be writing code instead of talking. So I hope you enjoy the homework tonight. I hope that you guys are starting to get really excited about these topics and about what's possible with programming and with web development. And good luck on the homework. So yeah, that is it for tonight. And I hope to see you all tomorrow so that we can go ahead and learn a little bit more about HTML and start to learn about CSS. All right, thank you guys and have a great night. Good luck with the homework, bye.